55. Starting in December, Fishing the DMV will be cutting back to only airing one episode per week until we hit our first Patreon goal of 100 Patreon supporters. We are only 55 members away from achieving our first goal. For less than a pack of Cinco's or buying a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help support the show. Patreon supporters will receive a special monthly discount off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Again, that's a special monthly discount off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Access to a private Facebook group community. They'll be entered into weekly prize giveaways with the winner being announced during Monday Night Live. They'll have access to special members-only videos and live streams, part of monthly competitions that we put on, and so much more. Again, we are only 55 members away from achieving our goal. And once we achieve it, we'll be putting out more and more episodes each week. If you would like to support the show and join us on Patreon, link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today I have a really special guest. I have on Brian Carter, and he owns a pretty damn cool website uh, that I think you guys have probably heard of once or twice, BassCast. Sir, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate this. Dude, man, Thomas, we really appreciate you having us on. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I, I checked out your show not too long ago, and it's a great show. And it's, you know, it's cool. We got your, like, DMV a little bit above me. So it's kind of cool. We're covering a lot of water right here in central Virginia, man. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, and really, I, how did you get started into this? Um, was this something that you've always wanted to do? Was it something just, you know, way leads on to way in your life, and, and you kind of just got into this position? So I, you know, I'll go back. Um, I grew up as a photographer, always been a photographer. Um, and uh, I was an editor in my yearbook in high school. Okay. So I love the editorial part. And uh, I had a couple of years and I did photography and then my senior year as the editor. And um, then, you know, years down the road, I started a, a lot of local newspapers were coming out with these little information magazines and it talked about what was happening in the local area and what's going on you know sports wise news wise and so me and a friend of mine created that it was called in view it only lasted about two years and then i jumped into the internet during a divorce yeah during a divorce i uh, built the basscast.com and you know they say good things come out of you know struggles sometimes and you know emotional times <clears throat> and that's what ended up happening we um i took the the paper that we had and I moved it over to the internet and it started taking off. It started doing really well. And I had a coworker that fished for the Bass Nation of Virginia that was right beside me. And he's like, dude, you know, code, you can write code and you know, you can do websites. And he said, why don't we put some fishing in it? So we started putting fishing into it and the fishing part just took off. I mean, it's like, I got to meet a lot of people. I got introduced to, um, the Bass Nation of Virginia president. And from there, it just started growing and growing and growing. And here we are today. It's been 12 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, it, it has been a long time, guys. I ain't gonna lie, but I was never really in a hurry to build this thing. You guys all know if you've ever been through a divorce before, um, you don't, you, you want to take your time growing stuff during the divorce unless you want to pay out. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't really want to make a check because I didn't really want someone else to get the check. <clears throat> but, you know, we built it. We feel like we've got the right people in place. You know, Justin Largan, one of our writers uh, on the kayak side, Bruce Callis, he's been one of our writers for a very, very long time. And uh, Jacob Stevens helped me and it helps me as well when I go to special events. And Danielle and uh, Alicia Matherly, she helps me cover events as well. So great team. I think it's all we really need and uh we're moving forward man it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and consumes me more and more and more so it was 12 years ago did you see it just being fishing when you said you were making the conversion from newspaper to digital and then your your, your friend said like, I, we should do a little bit of fishing stuff is that i was like oh we're gonna go all in on this i did not to be honest you know i was a you know i, I grew up fishing i'm not you know i grew up deep sea fishing that's what I started. My dad, my grandfather, all of us all went deep sea fishing. I grew up doing that side of fishing, pond fishing. We had a farm that was 30 minutes from the house. So we did a lot of pond fishing and, uh, you know, whatever bit the hook, just had a great time, you know, boys. 
And I really never saw the bass fishing part taken off like it did. And I'll tell you guys, I, I started going to tournaments. I built just a basic website. And the first website crashed. The second website crashed. GoDaddy crashed. I mean, we're talking about, I, I, I think I've rebuilt the website more than I have done anything else. But I would go to tournaments. I would get there 30 minutes early. And I would put flyers on every car in the parking lot. Because, mm -hmm. you, you know, social media was just starting to kick in then. I mean, it wasn't, it was still <clears throat> the college kids. You know, at one time for, you know, my kids says now all the old people on Facebook. But uh, Facebook was still for college kids. I mean, you, you know, unless you had a college email account when Facebook first started, you couldn't get on Facebook. And then it started to open up and, you know, get bigger and bigger and bigger to what that is now as well. So, but no, I never really expected it to take off to be as big as what it is now. I mean, no. It, it's so unique how opportunities kind of, they present themselves in such interesting ways. And, and it's so offhanded. It's not like when the movies, you mentioned Facebook, if you've watched the, um, the uh, social network movie uh, about Mark yeah. Zuckerberg, as like they try to make it out as like this is aha moment. And it was just as passive as maybe you and your friends like, what if we added fishing? Sure. And you don't appreciate at the moment the repercussions of that in 20 years and, and where you'd, you, you'd be led. I just think that's so fascinating. W when did the thing really start to explode then? You said 12 years when you really started thinking, I need to hire out a couple of editors. I, I will say, I'll be honest, um, I will say probably about eight years ago when I went to my first Bassmaster Classic. You know, when I first made that, le that leap to say I'm really, you know, to go from this little website that's in a little community and, you know, just covering a little stuff here and a little stuff there to go from where I said, okay, I'm making this investment to go to a Bassmaster Elite event. I, it's, it's no lie, guys. I signed up three days before the Bassmaster event. I jumped in a car. We drove eight hours, stayed at the event for three days and drove back home. And that's when it really exploded when I started doing that. I don't know if it was just that part of covering because Bass does an amazing job covering. You guys all know the Bassmaster Classic. I mean, if you've ever been in the media room for one of them, it's 200, at least 200 people rotating through that media room. And they do an excellent job. But I think it was just me making that commitment and people seeing me that we've that I talked to, related to and, you know, ha made friendships with. And that's when they knew that, you know, this thing's going to be more than what I had expected it to be. It sounds so much like the Mark Jeffries story about going from FedEx to like all of a sudden <clears throat> he's in a cardboard box at Clear Lake watching him, you know, watching Kennedy break the, the century belt. Just it, he saw an opportunity and he jumped on it. That's so freaking cool. It, how, how, when and how did did the, the COVID affect you? I mean, I'm assuming it was gangbusters, right? Guys, uh, COVID doubled our numbers here at the basscast.com. I mean, it really did. People that never before had started fishing. Um, the industry itself went through this boom. And uh, we, we're going to talk about a little bit later, my opinion on now. But, uh, you know, the industry itself just went crazy. And we never stopped fishing. I mean, I know a lot of tournament series stopped. But the basscast, we did a drive through weigh-in. We did that, you know, to keep, you know, for the COVID protocol we stood back and weighed their fish and gave them their fish back and we just kept the ball rolling i mean and it just from there i mean we went from twenty five thousand views to fifty thousand views and within the year after that we're sitting at like seventy five thousand views and it just just it expanded it, okay guys i don't want to say this it, it was the best thing for us it was the best thing for a lot of people but for the company as a whole, it was the best thing to ever happen for us because I think we were all allowed to take a little break. Tournament stopped. We got back to taking our kids fishing. We got back to the family part of it. And uh, a lot, I mean, you, we all saw it. Dang, you go to Walmart and rods and reels and lures were blown off the shelves. I mean, never before. I mean, to, even to the day, I went to our local Walmart, still full. But the, the world has changed, man. It, it, it has. but And that's what's so interesting. The reason I brought that up is for a lot of digital content creators, you could almost say it's it's your your, your pre-pandemic numbers and your post-pandemic numbers because it did 
just catapult everything. If you talk to a lot of YouTubers too, same thing. Their numbers like skyrocketed past that and people got so into fishing. I mean, I talk to guides all the time. It's like, yeah, I was taking out people that they were from the city and they just wanted to get out because they were locked in their house. And that was the only way they could do it. Uh, what, and, and then are, are you centrally located yourself in the Smith mountain? Like where specifically in that area, would you say you're, you are centralized? We're actually, uh, in, we're right outside of Lynchburg, Virginia. Lynchburg, Virginia. So we're, uh, we're about an hour and a half from Smith mountain Lake. We're an hour and a half from Bugs Island and we're about two hours from, uh, Lake Anna. That's a great so, location. It is a great location where I am. So we're very, very lucky about that. Just to, you know, I can make a quick trip down to Bugs, cover a tournament, come right back and do it all within like four hours, five hours. At this point, do you, tr what tournaments do you try to make versus send some, sending someone else just so you don't get burnt out? So Alicia came, we, we brought Alicia Matherly on about two years ago. <clears throat> and I have her covering all the Smith Mount Lake cat events. Um, and that's helped me out a lot. And um, but we still haven't found anyone from Bu for Bugs Island yet. So if you will, you know, throw it out there. If you're in Bugs Island area and you would like to cover some events for us in 2024, I'd love to talk to you because, you know, it would save me a lot of time and energy and miles. And but, you know, at the same time, I, I'm not a I can't sit down. I like to move. I like to get out. I like to see people. Um, I came from a whole family of entrepreneurs. So, I mean, it's, we're always making money, turning heads and moving. So, but I, you know, if Alicia's cover one, it's a big one. I like to go see, I'll just go to it. I mean, I just love being around the anglers. What have you seen with Smith Mountain Lake and Kerr over the years? I mean, since you've, you've been involved in that area for so long, have you seen big changes in, in that fishery, just the fishery itself and culturally around it? Well, we, uh, you know, we, tiger bass was introduced. You know, that was introduced probably, good gosh, 10 years ago now. Time, you know, I, you know, when you, as I'm 50 guys, and as you get older, people say you forget about time. But, you know, we're seeing the eight, nine pound bass. Um, we had that nine pounder weight in a bass cast tournament this year. I mean, two weeks ago. I mean, ho holy cow. I mean, whoever would have thought that we'd see a bass that big, I mean, on Smith Mount Lake. But we did. So, I mean, and, I'm pre they're predicting a 10 pounder next year. Oh God. I think there's, there's a 10 pounder there. Like it's swimming yeah. around there somewhere. I mean, that place is, and, and it's always been said, if that place had good hydrilla in it too, it would just be the lake period, full stop. Um, and I think it's a shame that that lake doesn't get more press coverage on a higher level. It's just a BFL lake, so to speak, or a right. cat lake. It, it and I and I and I hear all the complaints. There's not enough. There's no hotels. There's no nope. this. But then, but then you get stuck going to Kerr 37 times a year. And I get the money situation too. But if because I am have such a great relationship with, with this Department of Wildlife Resources <laughs> for Maryland and Virginia, and you get to see how much work they put in. It almost sucks when it's like, by the way, the big organizations won't show off these lakes that people have worked so hard to create. Lake Anna. I had John Odenkirk on who runs like, yeah, he said like, yeah, in a couple of years when the F1s kick in, it'll take 25 pounds every single time to win period, full stop. That oh, place yeah. is going to get better. You're not going to hear about that on the big circuits. And that's, a, that's a shame. You know, they're, um, you're talking about the F1s. I mean, I heard they're going into Gaston, uh, cause you know, some little two pounders or, you know, they need to be gone. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of changes there and, you know, they're now fighting for them to go into bugs as well because, Striped bass moved into there. You got the striped bass. You got the Alabama bass issue that they're yeah. fighting at, at Kerr. It Kerr, Kerr's a mess. Kerr is so big too. The amount of money that you're gonna have to throw at that to get the the largemouth bass reestablished there is gonna be it's gonna be a hard effort to pull. But but Smith right now, like like we said, like is in his prime. I mean, do you ever think we'll see a a Toyota? or some higher event, a Bass Open, or something of that caliber ever again. I think it was, you would probably correct me on this. Was it 06 was the last time the Bassmasters went there? Or was it I earlier? Wanna, it was, I want to say it's 06, 07 in that okay. area, or 07, 08 is like right in it. And I'll be honest, that's when I started. I was really just starting to get into it when they first showed up. I mean, it was, um, you know, we all, you know, this pat this year, we all, we saw the Open come to occur. I mean, that was a great success for them. I mean, the Chamber of Commerce and everyone down there said, we cannot wait to have them back. 
Um, it's thirty thousand dollars, guys, to bring one of those events to your lake, and that's what we were told uh, by them. But I mean, just the turnout, two hundred some anglers fished it. But I don't, just like you said about Smith Mel, like I do not see ever, never, ever, unless something changes, a big event again on Smith Mel Lake, other than the Big Bass Tour. I mean, Big Bass Tour, we were there, we we're the second. What was it? I think we were the first lake for them to have a double event, spring and fall. And then from there, they've yeah. gone and, you know, done a couple of other lakes double. But I think we were the first one to do a spring and a fall event because 800 anglers signed up. That, I get the money aspect. So if I'm in a tournament organization, I get that you have to have people pay. I get it. There are optics and issues then because what if you have eight lakes that are the Sabine that are willing to pay you. And then it's absolute shit. And so I get the balancing act there, but what could be done to reward these lakes where if your lake makes the top 10 list, it should be nominated at least. Something like that to reward states for putting in effort to make the fisheries better. I don't know the answer, but something like that would be kind of nice to see. Uh, when the elites were here, you know, we didn't have the Airbnbs and all that good stuff that we have now. That's true. And they were, and they were staying with. I mean, you know, I was hanging out with a bunch of different anglers, and we were. They were all just finding houses, and it was the networking. If it wasn't for the networking, you didn't know where to stay, because there's only one that one hotel, and they're not really keen to anglers. I mean, there's no boat plugs. There's none of that stuff there. I mean, unless they've added it. I have not been over there for quite a while. But there was no real, there's no major hotel. There's one, it's like right before you get to Hales Fort Bridge. Um, it might have 10 rooms in it. I mean, but we're talking about 50 anglers, more than that, 75 anglers. And then we're talking about places to stay, places to eat. Um, I don't see it happening. I really don't. I mean, Kerr is different. I mean, Kerr has got the hotels. They only have oh, yeah. two. But you can also go 30 minutes to South Boston. Or you can go, you know, Clark's Hill. So within 30 minutes or so, or the state park. And there's what? One, there's four state parks within 15 to 30 minutes. Do you think MLF would come here for one of their TV events? Um, They went to West Virginia, if I'm not mistaken, and finished re, uh, wrapping up uh, recording for that, I believe. Yeah. And they're... Uh, you know, next week, next year, they're going to the, they're going, uh, what, to the James? Yes. So, but it's another place there. There's lots of places to stay. I mean. Yeah, that's true. Th that's, that's the whole thing is killing Smith Mel Lake. And, you know, I, I know we, we don't want to get back into the people of Smith Mel Lake. You know, you talked about the grass killing and all that good stuff up at Smith, not good, bad stuff up at Smith Mel Lake. You know, I, I think they, they just want to keep it that way. And it's it's kind of like where I live. You know, they just want to keep it this way. They, they're they afraid to change. I mean, they wanted to put a big shopping mall down there where I where I live, one of big outlets. And really? yeah, bring lots of business and money. But we don't want that. We want this nice, quiet community. And I think that's what Smith Mountain Lake really wants. I mean, and they're not really keen on the anglers. I hate to say it. Yeah. I, th I think it, I think a change or something like that would help to incentivize places that it's not just about the money, but the fishing has to be good too. So you don't get it to where we'll pay you, but the fishing sucks because we don't care. But you want the incentive to be like, yeah, but guys, we have two other places that are cranking out massive bags and that's good for numbers. So work on keeping your fisheries good as well. Um, and this is again, just giving a nod to the, to the guys in Virginia that are trying to crank and work with, um, with Lake Anna, with Smith, places like that. Um, Gaston is interesting because it sounds like the issue I keep hearing is the marina size is an issue for bigger tournaments. But then I think the ABAs just came out with their new super turbo league. That's like a $10,000 win and $10,000 pot. And then it's uh, 150 plus boats, which is about a BFL size. So that it shouldn't be a problem. Man. Yeah, um, there's, you know, I was actually at Gaston a week ago. There's one ramp down there. And that's what's going to, I really don't understand why he's doing it there. Cause I was at this ramp. It's down past Eden's ferry. Uh, and it's not, it's a single boat ramp, plenty of parking, but a single boat ramp. So 
Okay, it's probably going to be a cluster. Let's just say that much. There's no other way to say it. It really is. It's going to be a cluster. I mean, it's going to be, you're, you're looking, you know, Eaton's Ferry, they don't want any boats there. And that's the only ramp down there that I know of. Guys, I haven't been to all of them, I ain't going to lie. But you could probably put in three boats at a time. Mm. And the rest of them are all one, maybe two at the most. I mean, it's three yeah, how long it's going to take bad. to put them in, take them out. Yeah, and, and that's the thing they is, get, I think if, that if they get the 150, yeah, if they get the 150, because like to me, it's like it comes down to the fishing being good. It kind of une- equalizes that. I mean, I was, um, I went down to the big Veterans Day tournament at Lake Gannis past week, and they had damn near 150 boats. I think they had 146. They were close to it. The ramp wasn't that bad, um, but it was okay because the fishing was good. You know, that's the big equalizer is as long as the food in the restaurant's good. Okay. It doesn't matter if the seats aren't perfect, but if you go to Gaston and it's basically three pounds, people are going to (laughs) bitch. Yeah. Cause I went down uh, earlier a couple weeks ago, I went down for the five alive championship and the boys from North Carolina hosted that there. And, you know, we're talking about 12 pounds a day, five fish. And you're talking about giving away a guaranteed five thousand dollars. I mean, come on, man, let's see some fish for five thousand. Mm-hmm. No, I, 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 I hundred percent agree with that. How does how did you get involved with Cat? That's a very interesting trail. That until I started this show, I didn't know much about being a Northern Virginia boy. So I actually, you know, I didn't know a lot about Cat besides them being just you know down in North Carolina, and then. You know, I went to their championship and I got to meet Brett and I got to meet the team with Cat. And they had started talking about moving up this way and becoming moving into Virginia. And, uh, you know, from there, they have a heck of a tournament series, average about 50 boats an event because they do give away. I think their championship, I think that's guaranteed 10,000 or 20,000 dollars to their championship yeah. winner. And it's usually about 150 boats dinner. So, I mean, it's, you know, and it's their, you know, their championships dinner in North Carolina. So it's on the, it's on the other end of all bugs, mm-hmm. Kerr Lake. But I mean, Brett and them run an awesome deal and they just keep growing and growing. I mean, it's, they have, I want to say at least 25 different tournament trails and they're all the way down into Georgia now. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I want to, we can talk about this really quick. You know, me and Danielle were talking about the season this year. I mean, next year for 2024. And we brought up the whole, th- you know, she's new at this. She's only been involved with it for, with me for about the last four years. <clears throat> and you guys all know, when I started this thing at the beginning, Federation, 200 boats, guaranteed. Uh, a region two tournament, which was the largest region in Virginia, guaranteed 150 boats. Angler's Choice, guaranteed 150 boats. You know, at an event, brand new bass boat given away. But now we've introduced CAT. We've introduced, you know, we still all got anglers. We still have the Bass Nation of Virginia. We got my series. We got a bunch of other little series as well. And now it besides this little you know little little dip now it's just straight you know heck federation region two 20 boats Mm. i mean it went from like 75 to 100 and is down to like 20 25 boats showing up for an event and it's it's really hard for me now to know where i need to go and what i need to cover because you just think it's oversaturation it is oversaturation it's very much is and it's you know when you're on the business side of it, you know, you can't just go cover a 10 or 15 boat tournament. You got to go cover a tournament where you're going to get the views, the likes, the watches. And I don't want to bring this up, but that's what Major League Fishing just did. They lowered their field because they want the views, they want the watches. And it went back to the limit. And they got rid of a bunch of anglers on top of that. But I mean, we're, you know, it's, you, you got to mm-hmm. get the numbers. You got to get the numbers right. To make the most amount of money. I mean, it's it's all about that. I mean, for everybody. You do. And I wonder how much of it also, I think there, there's two parts that what you said and with the Federation going down, is it people would rather fish locally than try to cut their teeth regionally. And so if I'm in Kerr 
I'm going to fish the cats because there's a tournament every year versus doing the Federation thing. I don't care about going to the elites. I'm just going to, you know, fish around here. You know, they, they, um, uh, they made a lot of changes when new owners came into the elites. Remember if you guys all know, right after Bassmaster was here on Smith Mount Lake might've been, you know, it's crazy. I worked my butt off then got to shake a lot of hands. New owners came in and a lot of stuff changed for the elite series. And now, you know, you're right. If, if you don't have four weeks of vacation, almost to burn to make it to a Bassmaster classic, why are you wasting your time? Mm -hmm. You got to yeah. fish a regional, you got to fish, you know, it's two or three different steps. And then we're not even talking about, you know, three or four different events that are located right here in Virginia. Not necessarily that if you make the state team, and then you got to go on and fish another event after that. So it's and I, Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. And this is something when I fished college tournaments and I would go okay. down to Alabama and people are like, well, wh well, where do you go? It's like, well, I live in Northern Virginia. Should I fish Kerr, Smith, the James is like, how much do you drive? It's like four to five hours. And they're like, well, shit, we go 10 minutes for all of our places. Like, you know, and that's why it's called the, my show is the DMV is because we're so transient. Like there are so right. many parts of my group that we drive all over God's earth <clears throat> to get to events compared to the Carolinas and Alabama. And I think with life and, and, and when finances get tight, I don't want to, if I live in a certain part of Virginia, let's say North of Richmond, I don't want to go 95 to Kerr and then Smith and then bounce back and forth because it, it just eats up time and money when it comes to gas. But also, you, you know, remember a couple of years ago that like if you fished the um, Angler's Choice and you qualified to that, you could go for that team championship as well through, you know, as long as you had so many people sign up and I can't remember all the different rules to it. But I mean, you know, they had the team championship. And you didn't have to fish the Bass Nation of Virginia. You just fished Angler's Choice. Practice one day. Yeah, and, and when you mentioned rules, that was something else that I, I've at least heard, and this could be just anecdotal, but when they changed stuff for like the BFLs where it's just a pay-to-play, where you didn't have to finish in the top for your in your division to go to the region. You could just pay an entry fee and get in there, and, and that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And I think it's a death by a thousand cuts on a bunch of different things and rules that changed that – People kind of just got, I don't know, they got off to the idea of like, I'm trying to go to the next level. And it's just, I just want to dominate locally. And then you create your own organization and then you create another organization. And all of a sudden here we are. Right. Yeah. There, you know, it is so much to keep up with guys. I am not lying. It is really <laughs> so much to keep on so much happening. And I'm lucky. I do have a lot of people out there that, you know, kind of like you're talking about your people, my people will tell me, keep me in the loop of what's going on. Cause there's no way. I mean, there's a video you post about this angler this week. There's a, you know, mm -hmm. something happening by this angler, you know, later in a two hours, we, the whole industry can be turned upside down in two hours, guys. I mean, that's how fast stuff is moving these days. It, it is so much. It is just drinking from a fire hose when it comes with all the information. And then we haven't even talked about the kayak thing, <laughs> which, oh, I feel like that is going to take a lot of people's lunch money in the next 10 years, um, especially. And again, I think we are uh, we, we are people of our surroundings. And so me being a Northern Virginia boy, a lot of people don't have places to put a boat, you know, in Ashburn right. and places like that. But they're like, I can go get a kayak and compete and it's cheaper. And I, I just wonder where that's going to go in 10 to 15 years as the app technology gets better. Um, Northern Virginia Kayak Association now, they got permission to, to fish all the DWR lakes for their tournaments Ooh. because guess what? They're not putting things in a live well. You take a picture, you right. put it back. Yeah, I it, think that happened this year. That actually happened. They opened it up where the kayak anglers could fish any, like you said, any DWR lake because, you know, we're catch and release. Do you think bass boat companies will start buying out kayak companies to get a little piece of that pie? Oh, that's a great question, to be honest. Because if I you was know, a skater, all, I would write a check and be like, I'll take that. <laughs> you know, we've all seen, you know, Hobie, Iconelli sitting in a Hobie. Um, you know, Brandon Polinick, him and his wife do a little kayak fishing. I don't know how much more anymore. They got a kid. But, uh, you know, you know, they're trying to build it up for that tournament series. And uh, like I said, Iconelli, you know, he fishes, I think, just one, maybe two events a year. Mm. But I... I don't know if I really see the business side of that 
because <clears throat> you know up until a couple years ago the as daniel would call them, glitter boat side did not like the kayak side at all i mean it was a nuisance for these people to be out there taking up their water it's not their water guys taking up their water fishing out of a kayak and i just don't I, I don't see any of them really merging or purchasing any of them i i think they like me and you talked about off the show um there's a lot of brands involved in kayak now everybody's gotten into it there's the business is about to implode it really is as a whole and a lot of people bought kayaks during covid and you know we get back to yes. what you were talking about, and we were talking about that during covid and helping me yeah that's what happened this podcast show that i have thank you for that because i was able to diversify that's the ones who made it were the ones who were able to diversify when there weren't a lot of tournaments to go to and you had content content still king and then you had the people fishing kayaks and you know teaching them how to fish and showing them you know lake fishing uh, lakes rivers you name it so i mean that's what helped us that's what helped us get right through covid but I, do, I never really see any of the bass boat guys ever buying like Johnny Moore. So, I mean, you, you guys all know he bought Ranger and he bought, uh, was it Triton or was it Skeeter? Triton, Skeeter, Triton. I think is owned by Yamaha or yeah, Yamaha owns right. Skeeter. Triton. Yeah, Triton. It was I, Triton and Ranger, I'll say. Yeah, it's, I don't know how much of it would be that the old guard gets into kayaking versus the kayaking kind of grassroots slowly grows to the point where if you're a kid in high school, you can't afford a boat, but you can get into right. kayak fishing. And, and, and that's where I think the threat is, is grassroots up versus, you know, the, the, the established coming down. Um, or maybe it's just a niche to certain areas of the country where kayaking just makes more sense too. Like, like California has their own, you know, bass trails and stuff like that. The, the, whoa, whoa wow. And maybe it just becomes like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, like you said, I, I think it's going to, it's going to be like certain areas are going to still do the kayak thing. Um, we all know, I mean, you know, there's the KBF, they've gone through ups and downs, uh, a lot of things changing over there as well. Um, and Bassmaster getting into it, major league fishing, they didn't, they decided to walk away from it. So I, I think it's going to be still, it's going to be the separation. I don't, I don't ever, I never see it merging together besides being like you said on a local series you know what's the um shoot what's the daggone magazine out there in california everybody gets it's a quarterly magazine they're just getting ready to come out their own tournament series this year and they're bringing back the you know they're putting the kayaks in it as well and we had the wild wild west series that closed up yeah. this took over for the wild wild west series they had kayaks in it so i still think it's going to be that localization thing i never foresee it being bigger yeah it a it co it's a bubble and covid just fast track kayaking you really you hit it on the head there where you have pre-kayak fishing and then you have post-kayak fishing where it right. just shot off like a rocket and i mean lord what are we only a couple years removed from that so i guess it is still in its infancy yeah i mean it grew so fast that changes were not being made you know we, you know, I'm big friends with Dwayne at Tony X. I've been friends with him since he started the app. And, you know, it's still got growing pains and he keeps growing. So it's you. you OK, so I, I want to say this. Somebody needs to come in to tournament kayak fishing. And I'm not saying just make one, but kind of make it a level. You know, we, we talked we talked about we had a meeting at the beginning of the year. Uh, it was with bass it was with um hobie and it was with uh, kbf and just trying to get on that one level playing field because everybody has their own set of rules and that's what's different about kayak fishing than the you know the glitter bass boat side bass boat side you weigh five only thing it might change is the inches that's it mm -hmm. you know it, it's this five fish the inches are based on whatever the the body of water that they're fishing that the game and fish tells them it has to be that is <clears throat> that is dead nuts accurate because when i have a kayak winter on it's like i won with 96 inches i'm a bass boat guy first it's like that doesn't translate like is that big is that not like what is 96 inches but if you tell me you caught you know a 25 pound bag you know my brain kind of right. can quickly be like damn that was a good day yeah 
So, I mean, so there needs a someone to come out on top and be a governing body of kayak bass fishing and trickle it all down and be, this is how it's going to be. And this is how it's going to be because, you know, like, yeah, a lot, of, I mean, take Justin Largan, for instance. I mean, you know, he's one of my writers and I mean, he fishes a bunch of different series. I, I keep up with all the different rules for each series. You can't porridge. You can't jump here. You can't, you can't take out here. I mean, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's so much that goes into it. Heck, I forget by the next tournament what I'm supposed to do. I have to read the rules before I go fishing. It, it really is. And that's, I'm fascinated by that whole thing, like where that's going to end up because it is, it is a, a, a kind of a business fight between, especially like Bass and Hobie and where that's going to go. Um, but then you mentioned like that governing body. So the economy, Bass, MLF, the great fight. We just traded out Bass and FLW for the MLF. It's basically the same thing, just different clothes. I, what do what do you see since you have your hand on the pulse of everything right now? And let's, let's start from the economy wise and and kind of work out from there. Uh, you know, we talked about during the show. I uh, you know before the show about the economy side of it, and I really see. You know, I collected cards when I was a kid. Maybe some of you guys collected baseball cards, football cards, etc. And the market got oversaturated, and I I foresee right now. You know, we everybody's. We're going to throw it in. A, I don't want to keep throwing. I hate COVID. I don't want to talk about COVID anymore. But, you know, we all saw everybody get into it during COVID. Mom and Pop are making jigs at spinner baits. I mean, you know, if you had the tech, if you had a garage, you were making plastics. And they were selling off the shelves because Walmart was blown out. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? It's sitting on the shelves now. And it's going to go like this. I hate to say it. I don't want to do this. But I hate to say it. I mean, you know. It needs to happen. I don't want to see businesses go under. I hate seeing business go under. I was small business once and I don't, I, you know, it sucks, but I foresee that the tackle market by next year, I mean, it's, I've heard shakeups at Berkeley. Uh, I've heard shakeups over there at, um, dang, what's the name of that company? All the kids started the YouTubers. Uh, Guggen. Guggen. Yeah. Guggen. There's been some shakeups over there. I mean, you know, these are two kids that, Came out with some great products because they had a YouTube following. Boom, there it is. That's the whole company. I mean, you know, you know, they they started because they had a great following and there are some great guys. And they said, hey, we could take the 80, 190,000 YouTube followers I have and make some product and they'll buy it. Would but you say would you say the backbone of the industry would be the boats? And if it is, I guess the next question would be that is terrifying to look at 2008 how much a boat is versus now yeah we're probably looking at 20 percent increase in boats i want to say at least that and we're not even talking about electronics guys oh my god but you know yeah yeah we don't even want to talk about that now but you know i was you know when i would hang out with the guys and gals from english choice marine which has been one of my sponsors from a long for a long time People were still buying the eighty thousand dollar boats. I, I, you know, I don't know if it's the glitz, the glamour, or what it is about that shiny object, but they were still dropping the eighties, and the thirties were still sitting there. I mean, it's it was just so weird. And excuse me, I wonder if it's because you can finance a boat for twenty five years, uh, right? Yes, but I'm just throwing this. I'm just throwing that out there. I mean, you can yeah. finance a boat for I know probably twenty, might be twenty five. I'd have to look that up. Some places 30. Um, I, I agree with you completely because I see this with the trucks now and I have friends that work in that industry where Ford and other manufacturers like, we're not going to get a base model anymore. We're going to get only the luxury models because we can charge more and, and people will buy it. But the problem is there, you can only finance for like five, six, seven years on that. So you're talking about a thousand dollar note per month, but boats, it's like, hell, you can buy that, that boat and you can finance it for so long. It doesn't hurt you as much. Well, you know, we'll talk about that as well. A lot of people now will go in and buy a boat and they'll get that warranty because I ain't gonna lie. I've heard a lot of conversation about some motors. We've seen motors go away mm -hmm. like the, about what is that last couple of years ago. And uh, they'll buy a boat, keep it right when the warranty is about to expire. It's out the door. It's sold. Another Ranger, Nitro, Triton, Phoenix, whatever they want to buy is in the garage. 
So they'll play that game and always have that boat payment. But I mean, if that's what you want to do. That's what you want to do. But I mean, whew, eventually it's going to catch up. Like with anything, it's like the idea. It's like, you know, the economy is too big to fail or you're too fat to die. Like it will hit that threshold when people say it's enough. And I am curious, as always, like, are we ever going to hit that? I mean, Icon's boat is like 130,000, 120, something like that. And it's like, that's base. That's not with all the fancy whistles. So are we going to see a $200,000 bass boat in the next five to 10 years? I want to know what's going to be on that $200,000 bass boat that's going to help me catch fish. It's just... You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's nothing on that. I mean, you know, I can go buy me a G3 aluminum bass boat for $30,000, $35,000, and I can fish the river. I can fish the lakes. It ain't, I think it's a 150 on the back of it. Get a few thousand dollars worth of electronics. And I mean, for under 40,000, 50,000, you fishing and you could fish tournaments. I mean, you know, would that be good PR for some of these boat companies to be like, listen, you don't have to run a 2023, a 2021 is fine. Just something like that to help some of these guys out. Cause I feel like that's a very interesting dynamic that if you make the big the big show and you were on a 2008 ranger that's an issue if you're talking about supporting a family finances and chasing a dream and i, I think that's a very interesting dynamic that doesn't get talked a lot of, uh, talked about a bunch i think it's pretty i think it's uh pure pressure i think it's because mm -hmm. of the sponsorship deals and the sponsorship money uh contingency money we've all seen that the last couple of years you know is you you know the age of your boat is less than what five years old or three years old i mean guys told me <clears throat> i know a father son at fishes and they told me that they were losing money because they didn't have a brand new 250 horsepower nitro because they were i mean they were winning tournaments and losing five thousand dollars every tournament almost that because, should yeah yeah because Oof, they didn't I'm have that brand new boat so that's where i was talking about that peer pressure and that dollar bill comes in is because you're going to give me 3K, 5K if I win a tournament that has 50 boats in it or more? I'm that, not sure. I don't want to dive in that because each one of them's got their own, you know, qualifications. That's where I think there's an issue in the sport where if you put so much of the financial backing into incentives, you're helping the 1% more than anyone else. So if you are a top tier angler, let uh, whatever his name is, and you run one of these boats that backs any tournament series, you basically have a car bunch to add so much to your paycheck every single time you enter a tournament. That benefits you because of the deal that you have. If you're Joe Schmo and you spend a hundred thousand on a on like a Phoenix, okay, great. You will never see the return on that. It's really hard to see that return on the investment just because you want an extra five thousand, ten thousand. Like I don't know. I just think that structuring is a little wonky and a lot of people don't understand that. I I get it back. I mean, I get that and I understand and you know it's, gosh, I don't own a boat. I don't want a boat. I ain't gonna lie. I've got a wilderness systems ride 115 in the basement. Well, it's on my, you know, outside now. But, you know, I think it really goes back to that thing about peer pressure. It really does. I mean, I you know, having that. that glitz and glamour, good looking boat going down a road. I mean, we're talking $50,000, $65,000 for the truck to pull it, another sixty to 65000 for it. I mean, for one hundred and thirty, forty thousand dollars the same thing I paid for my house that I'm currently sitting in. So, I mean, it's, and they got it in two items, and they got to drive those items to a lake to put gas in it, to fish a tournament. And if it doesn't have the right payout, you might win $1,000. If I was hired as Bass's PR manager, I, my hair would be white. Because if I tell you golf or equestrian sports, you you have a painting of what those people are like. It's the upper class. They they travel to Europe in Wimbledon. But then right. you look on the front of a professional bass person's boat, and they have much GDP as in a Caribbean nation. It's insane. How long does that image of a good old boy's sport last when it is so much freaking money to even get into it? Like, I think they're going to slowly become like, no, you're just you're the rich person's sport because it's kind of starting to look that way. 
<clears throat> you know, NASCAR got into that as well in the last couple of years. My dad was big into NASCAR. I mean, he was actually worked for a team in NASCAR before I was born. This is when you brought two sets of tires and an engine builder and one other person. And now you got computers and now you got all the stuff running everything. And we got maps and we got, you know, a tr you know, I, I watch these guys pick up their trolling motor that probably weighs five pounds, maybe 10 at the most before you put all the electronics on a trolling motor you got now. I mean, I watched a guy break. Or, I mean, I heard not watch. I heard a year ago a guy broke his strap, fell backwards, hurt his back. We're picking up so much electronics on a freaking trolling motor now that it's attached to these 15 inch monitors. But if you don't have it, you won't win. Period. And it's yeah, and it's funny because people say, like, well, what you want everyone to fish out of the same boat? It's like, well, if you remember like the classics that Ike and Ellie used to win, yeah, that's what they used to do is they all had about the same stuff. It was an even playing field. Like, so it's not unheard of. I'm not saying we go back that way, but no. But you if you, you know, but that's what Major League Fishing did. Major you know, League when, Fishing is weird because they had a lot of great ideas that were probably not executed great, but the ideas were were very neat. But they had everybody set up with the same boat. Mm -hmm. Had it all wrapped, sitting there waiting on you. And Bass did the same thing when they started. You know, they would put them. You guys all saw it's the 50th anniversary of Bass. We saw the magazine. It was actually an excellent magazine because it, it was really, really freaking cool. But they would put everybody in a plane and wouldn't know where they're going. Mm -hmm. Drop them off. Boats would be sitting there waiting on them. Do you know how cool that is, though? That's like, That's like cool know. as crap. I mean, it's awesome. Cool. It, it I mean, is. Oh. I mean, it, it separates the men from the boys. It really does. I mean, a, a true professional fisherman. That MLF show where it's they blindfold the guys and drive them to the lake, that is so cool to me when I was a kid in, co and in college, and I'd watch that because, like, this is how it is. You're not going to the Hartwell for the 30th time. It's we're going right. to blindfold you and dump you in the lake, figure it out, Godspeed. I, I don't think they execute everything great, but it's like you have this really cool idea, but you just – or you create something for the internet, but the internet's not around yet. I don't know if it's maybe like that, like it's too ahead of its time, but God. Right. You know, I, I, I don't want to spin off. Your, I kind of wondered, was the bass cast too, too ahead of its time, really? I mean, you know, people were just starting to get into the Internet. People were just starting to get in a bubble. I mean, I screwed up, made some mistakes. I, I, I put a chat bot on a daggone website before they were even, you know, now we got chat bots everywhere. You know, I, I you didn't know because we were in that bubble of 50 to 60 year olds were still 40, I say 45 to 60 were still the dominant players in the world of bass fishing all the way down to the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. and, How much has that changed? Like if I, if I could oh, say like wow. with, with your analytics, like I know my analytics, I don't capture the 14 or 15 year old demographic very no. much. And, and so I kind of feel like that's just the way it is because of technology and, and how kids are so ADHD. You know, now, like you're saying, now we got the TikTok and we got all this other stuff and everybody wants to watch the shorts and everybody wants to see that fish catch really quick. They don't want to wait for the whole, you know, the whole build up. They just want to watch the catch. Uh, you know, mine's probably about 25 to 40 is what the age group of mine is, to be yeah. honest. That's my analogs for the most part for that age. And you're right. You know, the young kids don't want to sit there. And that's what I wonder what Major League Fishing is going to do in the future. And just like we just said, you know, you, you know, we all saw the press release. We're going to, we're dumping all over the place on this thing. We all saw the press release come out where they're going to put, you know, cameras on a lot of the boats and on about every boats. We're dropping down to 50. We're going to be showing you fishing for nine freaking hours. The kids these days want 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. We got football. What do we got? The, the red zone, NFL red zone, every touchdown, every big play. They don't want to sit there and watch a game for three hours anymore. They want to see that touchdown. They want to see that run. They want to see the play. They want to see a eighty, you know, eighty run, eighty yard run back. You know what I'm saying? They want to now. They don't want to yeah. see eight hours of bass fishing. And I understand the forty. Well, I say this. I say I'm a gender X, so I say fifty to sixty, sixty-five. Mission retirees might enjoy watching it. 35 and below we're living some crazy different lives now than you know than we did 
So I, I wish I invested a lot. I, I really do. And, and yeah, it's just so many great ideas there. And when you bring it up, it, like with football, Bassmaster really strikes me as like they're in major league, they're, 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 they're MLB, they're major league baseball. It's we've done this for 300 years since our great grandfathers and nothing's going to change. This is how we do it. And I think the one thing I'll just give MLF credit for is at least they constantly are trying to change to hit the sweet spot. Yeah. And if I was Bass, that's what I'm worried about with them is eventually they'll crack the code if they're still around. If they keep adjusting, they'll figure it out. And Bass has got to make some adjustments because I think you're right. We don't want an eight-hour... The general public doesn't want an eight-hour tournament that they stare at the back of a guy's head. Um, the NPFL did something really freaking cool with adding the graphs actually to the screen for everyone to watch. That's neat. Yeah. Yes, that is really neat to watch that because everybody else is already watching the graph as well. Yeah. Why not watch it too? I mean, if we're just going to see this yeah, or this, we might as well watch it with them. That, that, it, it's such a brilliant idea. And and then the, and then we haven't even brought them up, which is the NPFL. Now, now you got three contenders. I, can we have three? I mean, we already talked about the grassroots too much. And I, this is the same argument. Like Mark Jeffries had five or six years ago with, with FLW and bass. It's like, can we have two? And it's, I, Throw your hands up. I don't know. You know, I, I will I will say this, you know, about Major League Fishing, and we'll jump over to the NPFL. I, if, you know, you guys don't, you know, Major League Fishing promised right at the beginning of this thing, free entry, mm -hmm. all this money, catch and release, which is good. Catch and release. We love that. Cat, You know, the kayak, I mean, but, you know, they started to run out of money. I heard rumors of people not being paid. I mean, it, it, it had started going south. And if they don't run out of money, it might give them enough chance to figure it out. And, you know, I'll tell you this. Thank God for uh, Johnny Morris. Yeah. I mean, writing that check. I mean, I know there's a lot of other investors. We all know, um, you know, Kevin Van Dam. Uh, uh, Kevin Van a, was one of the investors. And we know uh, Iconelli had a lot to do with it as well. And there's one more, and I don't know why I can't think of his name right now, but there's about three or four different guys that, you know, were the major part of this whole thing getting started. Geet Reese, Edwin Evers, one of those guys? Uh, no. Uh, it might be Edwin, but I'm not sure. But it doesn't matter. If they, don't run out of money, if they don't run out of money before they keep changing this damn thing and pissing people the hell off, they might be around. Is it the personalities? Is it people that fear change? Like, why do you think there was such hatred and venom towards that? It's so example is catchway release. MLF didn't invent that. Bass did that for years for the Texas tournament right. on Fork. It's nothing new. Bass actually could have done that first, but they didn't choose to. But it got tagged as an MLF thing. And now every kite, like, that is going to be the wave of the future, by the way, for so many states if the rules get changed and regulations like catchway release stuff. So that's coming, I think. But the point is, it's so interesting. Like anything MLF, there's a great portion of them that are just, it's almost like politics. It's insane, the division. The, you know, the bad thing from me, and, you know, I would say looking at it as a business, you know, you know, we, we bring us up at the lunch table all the time. Bass fishing now is you fish and you're a business person. You're, you yourself are a business person and you have to do what's best and what's right for you. And if I'm a business making changes all the daggone time and I got a new CEO coming in or I'm making a rules change every month or I'm eliminating going from 80 anglers down to 50 anglers, you, you don't want to be a part of that. You get scared. I mean, is it willing for me to invest? <clears throat> and we saw that when, you know, we saw that when, Major League Fishing took over and it got rid of the Forestwood Cup and all those people are qualified for. I mean, yeah. good God in heaven's name what that stirred up. Bad I mean, optics. people were pissed. I mean, people were extremely pissed because they saw that right there. I mean, I don't work my ass off coming up through and you get rid of the golden prize. Just even now, say I fished the F you know, Forestwood Cup. You, you're, yeah, because I think Brian Thrift won the last forcewood cup ever if i'm not mistaken um I think you're right but that that's besides the point but i, I agree like th 
they did such a terrible job PR wise. I have no idea why they didn't say like, we're going to make sure everyone got taken care of here before the transition. Just to save face. You I say they still yeah. do. They still do a awful job PR wise. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I think they really did. And, that, and that's why to me, like I've always said, MLF is a great idea that were just not executed very well. And it's a yeah. shame because I really think the idea of smaller fields is brilliant to where you can go to separate lakes. I think the idea of having a day off so you can actually rep your sponsors and people could go meet and greet the fans. That's got that's a not a bad idea. It's got potential. I can actually go if I want to see when Kevin Van Dam was around. And I know he fishes on a Monday, but Tuesday he's going to be there to work a booth. I can go visit him. That's right. I, that's a cool idea, but that's dead okay. now. <laughs> But they also had that when they first started. Remember, they had that uh, the final day. If I remember correctly, the big events mm -hmm. were held. You know, once Johnny came involved and the check got wrote, you know, I think that was one of the speculations was, you know, the, the final day was at a Bass Pro Shop. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I forgot about that, too. And, you know, <laughs> just same as the Opens. Because, you know, the Opens were held, you know, at a, at a Bass, Bass Pro Shop. shop. The weigh-in was there as well for the final day. You know, they'd fished two, you know, the first two days were at the lake. When it cut down the fields at a 10, the 10 showed up at a Bass Pro Shop. And it was the same way for, you know, Major League Fishing. And trailering a boat. If the weather's bad so no one gets hurt, you can trailer to another ramp just for safety reasons. That's a right. that's a no-brainer. Like, So, yeah, again, I, I guess, like, the thing is, I, I think MLF has done a lot wrong. But what's sad is when all this is said and done, I think the ideas will be dead unless another organization, I think MPFL, they seem to be the quiet dark horse here where they're like, you two kill each other and we're just going to slowly just grind away and we'll set a schedule that works for everybody. We just going to stay quiet in the background and just, you know, just rack up W's. Hey, I'll tell you guys this thing right now. I've had the president of the MPFL on Bass Cash Radio and uh, it's it's nine people run that company, guys. Damn. There's nine. There is nine people, not a hundred. There's not 150. There's nine people that work their ass off to make that thing happen. And I believe exactly, exactly like what you just said. They are staying quiet. And they are, you know, you fish all three days in the NPFL. So, you know, anything could happen on any day. And, you know, a year ago, everybody voted on the $100,000 payout to the winner. And now we got Patrick Walters. Great friend of the Bass Cash, cash and checks. I mean, he he's building a brand new house, and I think the NPFL just paid for it. Who in your mind right now that you're covering it, is one of the guys that it's not, and we've always talked about fishing in business, as you eloquently put a little bit earlier, who is one of the few that just fishes. And, and for an example, my mind is like the John Cox where – if he could, he would literally fish all three or maybe six series and bounce around. Is, is that a dinosaur of a, of a bygone era or, or, or are they still around? You know, they, they talk about fishing. You know, if, if you're not cashing checks, if you're not fishing tournaments, you're not winning money. And, you know, yeah, I was going to say John Cox as well. I mean, I mean, that was an amazing season for him. If it wasn't for family, he wouldn't have been able to do it at all. I mean, it's great, great support. His wife's awesome. Two da his daughters are cool. Um, but you know, I just, you know, we're going to have to see that split and I don't really ever foresee that ever really happening again. It's like, you know, back in the day we had our two sport, Bo Jackson, he played football and he played baseball, Deion Sanders, football, baseball. Yeah. I mean, you know, we had them two sport athletes and now it just takes so much and there's so much expectations that I, I don't really ever foresee that happening again to be honest in our I mean, our lifetime i mean i you know a lot of anglers would go home work fish some pickup tournaments around the neighborhood take some money from some locals but i, I just don't see it ever happening like that i mean there i don't think that i don't think the tournament trails want to play nice with each other i don't think they will and i think you know, it kind of like segues into that that YouTube video that just got dropped that has gone very viral uh, with that individual being very passionate with his viewpoints on sponsorships and, and where we're at, where I just want to fish and hunt. And some some people might say he makes some good points, but it's also to understand like it's 2023. This is the world we're in. It's yeah, I that's great, but that's not where we're at. 
Yeah, Mr. Fouts, we're going to have him on the Bass Cash Radio tomorrow on Wednesday night. Mm. And uh, But, you know, he's an introvert. He came out right off the bat and said that, you know, he doesn't like being around people. And he just likes fishing tournaments. But, you know, you you know, it's not going to happen anymore. I don't see it. I, I, I don't see that, you know, he lost sponsors. But you're going to have to have some social. You're going to have to have some following. You're going to have to have Instagram. You're going to have to have Facebook. As much as you hate it and as much as you don't want to be a part of it and, you know, have to respond to your followers and all this other crap, you're going to have to do it. I mean, because I was watching a video about a month, well, about a year ago, and it was something totally different from fishing. But the guy said straight up, he said, if I don't have... 15,000 Instagram followers, this company won't even talk to me. And I had somebody, they, you know, we're friends now, but when I first got started, they told me if I didn't have 10,000 Instagram followers, we don't do business with you at all because they need a return for their buck. I mean, and just like Fouts brought up in a video, you buy a damn Jersey for a hundred dollars. And, you know, Amanda, you know, Amanda with, uh, you know, our, our Jersey company, you know, Heck, you can put whatever you want on a damn thing. It's free advertisement. And it, it does kind of hurt the guys who are doing a professional level a little bit. I really don't see where that hurts as much because, you know, if you are a professional angler, Bass is giving you that platform. TV, yeah. magazines, newspapers. It is so interesting when they write the book on this part of history, especially with the YouTube. And you had that first generation of SB Fishings, the the Johnny B's, the guys that got into it on the ground floor, probably did have a legit following. And then the way they were treated by the establishment. And then you had the companies then, because of course, companies lag behind everything. So they, they lag behind like what YouTube is. And now it's, we need to have the, the subscribers, of course. And now everyone's on to like, well, then we can just buy the subscriber base if that's what you need. And now I think we're going to hit the other end of this thing where we're going to use other metrics eventually. Cause I know like Disney got caught with their hand in the cookie jar cause they were buying bots and things like that to pad their numbers. Right. And like, so it, it's so weird since 2008, we've gone on this arc with it all. And it, I'm fascinated to see where this thing ends up because it really is not just about your subscribers. It's about your reach and in your fan base, honestly. I mean, example is Scott Martin's probably the classic example where he really understood, I think ahead of time, we're like, I need to get a cameraman to follow me around. Yeah. And he built a brand and he should write a, a class on that. I think he did a really good job of showing you how you need to do this. If you're a professional angler. And, you know, the business side of it, you know, I, I became a Gary Vaynerchuk fan, a Gary V fan. Mm-hmm. If anybody knows who he is, I mean, all of us in business know who he is. I mean, he's cusses, swears, tells a great story, but he's got a cameraman that follows him all the time and records his journey. And uh, you're right. I mean, that's what it's going to be is people, and we we have it now. We got it. The classic Cruz has, you know, he's got his photographer, local angler right here. We all know who he is and videographer. And a lot of the anglers went that way and decided to start Brandon Polinick. I mean, he's probably, to be honest, <clears throat> you got Scott Martin, the 40 year olds, Brandon <laughs> Polinick, the, tw- the 18 to 25 year olds. And they are right now leading the way in his social media thing. I mean, it, they really are. I mean, I, I mean, I ain't gonna lie. I love Brandon Polnick. I love, uh, crap. What's the dude's name? He records all his videos. I don't know why I dropped my mind, but I mean, he does an excellent job. Milliken too. I'm sorry. That just propped my mind. Cause he just oh, made yeah. the leads too. Yeah. Um, when did it become cool? You've been in this, the media side of things for so long. I remember a couple years ago where YouTubers, for example, were kind of looked down on. They're not fishermen. And now it's like all the big fishermen are becoming YouTubers. So there was a transition period where it became okay to be doing that. You guys, I mean, I'll tell you this. If you guys went to Redcrest or went to the Classic, there was some kid. I don't even know his freaking name, but he's got a freaking rod made after him. He's a YouTuber. He doesn't fish professionally anything, I don't think. Maybe some opens or something. Just some little stuff. He's got a rod. I mean, they had a booth dedicated to this kid that's a freaking YouTuber. And I think the business made it. The business of bass fishing said, I want your jersey 
out. I want to see your jersey more than just on the stage for that 30 seconds of you holding up some fish. And you got to give me more. And when they wanted more and more and more, it, it became that. And I think it's going to bust as well, too. I mean, it's it's sponsorship. You can only do so much. And like you were saying earlier about the business and the multi-sport and fishing crap loads of tournaments, that it, it's that's going to wrap up as well. Because Black Rifle Coffee, that's what I'm drinking right here, guys. I want you to show up at Bass Pro Shop this week. You know, you can buy Black Rifle now in Bass Pro Shop. I want, you know, Scott Martin to show up there for three hours. Because I'm going to pay you two entry fees. And boom, a lot of people have dropped out of it. You're under that person's thumb. Mm -hmm. And then you feel like you have, just like Fouts said, I'm either living for that sponsor or I'm living to fish. And I just want to fish. And only the 10% are going to be able to win and be, you know, be just like in NASCAR, 10%. The rest of them are just the 30 other cars that are sitting on the track. And that's what fishing's pretty much about. You know, every, you know, hopefully you're hoping, you know, in NASCAR, you're hoping about 10 or 20 cars crash. That way this guy back here in the back, Brian Carter driving, you know, number 29 screams on through and gets a win. And you're hoping a couple of other anglers have some bad days. Where, you know, you actually get a win or a top two or top five and cash that good one good check a year. But how often does that happen, man? How often does it happen? It, it doesn't. And that kind of brought me back to before we, we started recording here, we were talking about this a little bit. The one that really shook me weirdly was Bradley Hallman. Yeah. It, him, it, it's just like that quiet guy that like, like it, there's nothing, no one says anything wrong about him. He just shows up, he does his thing. And when he stepped away, it's like, is that the canary in the coal mine or is it just him? Is it just him or is this something else that's going on here in the industry when Bradley's like, I am i can't do this anymore. I'm done. Uh, Bradley's got a great support team at home and that's the one good thing. I ain't going to dive into that too much, but he's got mm -hmm. a great support team at home and, you know, he did take it pretty hard. I ain't going to lie. I, I reached out to him and uh, we've been knowing each other for about 10 years now. And, you know, we are going to catch up. We are going to talk, but, you know, <laughs> I, I put something together about this year and we saw the, we saw the age of these kids coming in from the opens into the elites. I mean, you're talking about 18 year olds, 19, 20 that will be in the elites next year. And we're talking about, you know, a field it's, it's going to be, Okay, just like I said earlier, that transition, the imploding of bass fishing, here it is right here. The young kids are showing up. The young kids know all the electronics. They all sat on computers. They're all sitting on the iPhone. They're all sitting on the iPad. And they got this stuff dialed in. And some of the guys are just saying, hey, I don't really see investing any more into this as it is as a whole. I mean... And leaving a sport you loved and you spent many, many hours into, we wrote up a piece about that on the basscast.com. And, you know, it's, it's tough. The crazy thing was I just dropped that, I dropped that piece like last week. And then Bradley did what he did, you know, Friday, they came out the press release and the whole internet went crazy over the weekend. But it's, it's gonna, dude, we're gonna re, this is almost like, Major League Baseball during the drug era. That's that's a yeah. Damn, it really a, is. It's, it's going to be a yeah. chunk of time right here that we're going to look back in the next, let's say, five years down the road of this transition, and we're going to see who who's still here and who's gone. I, I would even say that we could take that analogy and put it towards forward facing sonar. Yeah, Patrick Walters winning in Lake Fork during the COVID year. Yeah, really blue forward facing center. I think it, it took it from here to here. It, it's when you saw Mark McGuire for the first time. It's like your head just grew three sizes. The weights were insane. Everyone was talking about it. And then the next year, how many people were running forward facing sonar? And if there's any nerdy analytical people watching, I would love to know the weights of tournaments from that point on and then two years prior to see if there was a big jump in the weights in the top percent. Because I just that stood out to me in my mind for some reason. 
<clears throat> we went to forward facing sonar to anglers with three different companies on their boat. Yes. I mean, we really did. We, you know, John Cruz, I mean, he's got Garmin, he's got Lawrence. I mean, he's got hummingbird. I mean, I don't know if he's running it currently now, but I mean, we went from that thing where, you know, we've seen on these professional boats three, we've seen them stacked up like this 15 inch monitor stacked up and the one in the back talking to all the you know talk, usually i think a lot of them run the lawrence I, I think a lot of them like that because they talk really well together but you know we we saw this where if you don't have you can't compete oh. and a, a lot yeah. a lot of the older guys that i know when i first started dropped out and they just said you know i i, I can't afford the boat my first boat cost less than these electronics it, it, it's insane. I remember a couple of years ago when Justin Lucas won uh, up north, and this was after he, he, I guess, they he departed from his Hummingbird deal, and he said, like, you cannot compete if you do not have Garmin. And that was before Hummingbird and Lawrence came out with all their stuff, and it created a lot of drama for some of these guys. Like, if you were literally in a deal with Lawrence or Hummingbird, you were hurting your way in bags because it was that important. And if I remember correctly, John Cruz broke away from all of them. And he didn't want a deal because he 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 broke away from the whole deal altogether because he wanted to run all three, and a lot of them did. And they had success, and that was Jacob yeah. Wheeler, another good one that did that yes. too. Yes, one hundred percent. Brian, I you know I, I don't want to keep you for for six hours. I really you know do appreciate <laughs> all all the time. Um, we we can usually go long here for sure. So I want to be be good of your time here. C could please tell people what you have coming up and where they can find you. Uh, guys, the basscast.com. That's the name of the website. Basscast radio is our podcast show. We drop a weekly podcast on all the podcast and networks, uh, the basscast.com on Facebook, as well as, um, Instagram and, uh, basscast news. I think that's what it is on Twitter. Guys, Twitter has been blowing up since Elon took over. I mean, we've gained a lot of followers and thank you that as well. But, uh, you know, we're about ready to wrap up the season here in central Virginia. Um, we've got, an a bass cast tournament trail event this weekend on Smith Mount Lake. And then we had our championship in December the 9th cats about ready to wrap up. So 2024, it's going to be an awesome year for the bass cast. We're already making plans and we'll see you guys at the expos. We're going to be, uh, we'll be at the uh, Knoxville expo down in Tennessee. We love that guys. If you ever get a chance to go down there to that expo and I've turned on a lot of people, I know, a lot of people from my area will have made it into a vacation. It's that good of an expo and they will come down and spend the week with their wives and go to the expo. So come on down to Knoxville and uh, hang out with us at the expo there. And uh, we'll be walking around and shaking hands and talking to anglers and hanging out with my uh, bass geek, who is my co-host on the podcast show. But uh, come on down for that. And then uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to Richmond. It won't snow or they won't cancel it or, some about Richmond show, dude. What is it like every year it snows or some crap? It, I mean, I, they win the lottery with that every year. It's insane. Yeah, Thomas. It's like I've gone down there in snow. I've gone down there with ice on the ground to the expo. I mean, it's it. It's some about the luck. And uh, last mm -hmm. year we went down to North Carolina for that. There, you know, because they have their two. They have their show in North Carolina. Then they come up to Richmond, and that's a great show, and guys. Kevin Van Dam's going to be down in North Carolina. He's going to be on, there on Friday for that. I'm not going to that mayhem, I can tell you that. But uh, he'll be at the uh, Friday only, the expo down in North Carolina. So That's so cool. So cool. Then we start the season, and I'll be chasing bass again. And then if people want to join your tournament organization, um, when will you have the, the schedule for the next year release? How do they sign up for that? <clears throat> Actually, uh, we're, we're going to start working on that probably over the holiday. Um, I, I don't, I, I believe in holidays, but I work all holidays. I work all the time. I'm not going to lie 24 seven on this. And uh, we're going to work on that over the holidays. We try to wait for all the schedules to come in and, uh, the, Hopefully by uh, December the 9th, we'll have our schedule out. We always try to get it released before our championship. And that way, you know, everybody knows and can start planning their year. And we can make that a whole freaking show as a whole, brother, because we know what's happening next year. What's happening next year? These single boat tournaments that are going to be happening this year. You know, we got Elite 70s 
going to do a single tournament. Cat's going to do a single angler tournament series like the elites and the death of the co-angler. Are we witnessing that? Whoa. I know. I've been, I've been thinking about that for a while and you know, it's, when will BFLs start saying like, if you pay five hundred, six hundred dollars an extra or whatever, you don't have to have a co angler. When are they going to do that? Because I wonder how many people are like, if I don't have to deal with a co angler, I'll pay that extra fee. I've always been curious what those numbers would look like if you had that option. Yeah, I mean, I, you don't want to say to have a co angler, but you are right. I mean, it's man, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, it's it's a hot topic, but I wonder how many people it's in the back of their head. But we'll save that for for, for another day, guys. Uh, link in uh, the episode description about everything that we talked about as well. Uh, if you guys could give, please give him a follow. Like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.